If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel according to Mark. As we, as we talked about last week, there are three different Gospel accounts of the story, and they share just some slight different details in each story. And we're going to use Mark as our base story, but we'll be looking at Luke and Matthew as well. So Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, and then we're going to skip past uh, the situation with the woman with the issue of blood, and we're going to uh, read 35 and 36. When you have it, say amen. I need your attention. Chapter 5, verses 21 through 24 says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. This is when the woman with the issue of blood touches Christ. Let's skip down to verse 35 and 36. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much that as we wrestle with our faith, our fears, our doubts, that in this space you're willing to wrestle with us. We want a Jacob-like experience. If it takes us wrestling all night long, we will do so. We don't want to be afraid. We want to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't be afraid, just believe. So I, um, I, I follow sports. Um, I, I enjoy basketball. I enjoy football. I watch baseball uh, it, during the playoffs because I don't have time for 162 games during the regular season. I'll catch a couple of Dodger games already have uh, this season. And... Um, but I'm a responsible sports fan. I, I, I don't get too emotionally involved. If my team loses, like last week, I'm like, God is still on the throne. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't take anything away from me, I, you know. Still a father, you know. Still a pastor. You know, they, I, they're not giving me any of their paycheck. So I'm not going to, I'm not losing any money in this. And so I just, it's entertainment. But it's healthy from a good distance. And, and continue to pray for me because I one day don't want to ever have to like check scoreboards, right? You know, you just want to be able to, if you happen to catch it on TV, you go, oh, I remember the Raiders. I remember the silver and black. Those were the good old days. My son's great because he's not into sports like that at all. It means nothing to him. And uh, I remember his age, I wouldn't want to go to school if the Raiders lost or if the Lakers lost. That's how emotionally invested I was. So when the playoffs come around, they, they, they always like to have a special theme for the playoffs to get you all pumped up. And, and one of my favorite uh, sayings during these intense struggles between good versus evil, my team versus the rest of the league, is this commonly used phrase. Go big or go home. Go big or go home. Oh, that, that's, that's a challenge to anyone's manhood. Sorry, ladies. It just hits us a little bit different. Go big or go home. And I, 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 I'm challenged by this because, because this, is, this is a challenge for us to come with our best. Bring it all or you'll be sitting on the couch come next week, right? And the rest of the world is... Is, is, is seeing the competitive juices in other leagues now, the WNBA, oh boy, I'm, I'm sitting there watching it, hearing the same stuff, go big or go home. Ladies are like, men, we can do this just as well as you. And so it's, it's just, it's everywhere, it's prevailing. Go big or go home. Bring your best, practice hard. Through your sweat, through your energy, 
you can accomplish all things. So this is good stuff. But this message is a little bit different. Go big and go home. Jairus is a very influential man, and he's a leader of one of the synagogues, one of the local synagogues. He's a man of means, just like the woman was a man, a woman of means in uh, our last week's message. Remember, she gave all of her money to physicians and no one could help her. Jairus is also a man of means and influence. And to publicly endorse Jesus at this time was kind of a bit risky to one of the leader's reputation. Pharisees and Sadducees and synagogue leaders had to be very careful. Teachers of the law had to be very careful because they were still vetting Jesus at this time. But Jairus was all in. He was like, this man is special and my daughter is about to die. Now in the Greek, the word that is used is that she's about to take her last breath. It's not that she's just sick and they're concerned about how high her fever is. They know that she's on hospice. They know that today is the day. Just recently, one of our, our, our members, our mother, passed away. And she called me a few Fridays ago and she said, Pastor, can you come by and pray with my mother? We believe today is her last day. And so I went there and when I walked into the home, you could tell, you could feel it in the house. And those of you who have been through this experience, you know you've been there. Maybe a parent was on hospice or a, a, a family member. So you know what that feels like when you're at death's door. And so the father knows that this is critical and he's asking for Jesus to come and lay his hands on her. And he knows that she will be made well. And Jesus' response to the father is very interesting. He tells the father, first commandment he gives the father is, do not be afraid. It's not do not doubt, do not worry. The word is do not be afraid, but believe. Now, growing up, I was told that there were opposites to words, antonyms, not synonyms, but antonyms, right? What would you say the antonym is for, for love? We have love, what would you say the an, an antonym is for love? People usually say hate, right? Usually say hate. Sometimes they'll say indifference. I heard somebody, I think, in the balcony use another word. What was the other word? Fear. That's another word. In fact, I have changed the way that I see the opposite of love. I used to say indifference or hate. Some people don't say hate because they say it has too much emotion. There's too many feelings and emotions involved. Indifference is a better one. But I would tell you, now after reading more and more of the Bible and understanding the conflict between good and evil, I would tell you that fear is the opposite of love. Now, what's the opposite of faith? There's faith and there's what? Doubt, that's what you would say. But do you know that faith and doubt can exist together? Do you know that? That faith and doubt can exist together? It happens. How many times have you believed someone, but there was a little bit of doubt in what they said? Have you been there? Absolutely. There are doubts. Do you know that Jesus also had doubts, even going to the cross, that there were doubts? He still believed his faith overcame his doubts, but faith and doubt can exist. Watch this. What's the opposite of courage? What would you say the opposite of courage is? You would say fear. But do you know that people who are courageous also have fear? So fear can't be the opposite of courage. So I'm going to tell you today that the reason why Jesus tells him not to be afraid is because fear is the opposite of faith. Most of us struggle with fear, and that is why we cannot believe. Fear paralyzes us. Fear will keep us from moving. Fear will have us being disobedient. Fear, fear will prevent us from loving and being vulnerable. In fact, fear is the worst 
In fact, I would tell you that the root of sin and rebellion is fear. Fear. Some of you are afraid of not being recognized, afraid of not being loved, afraid of not being worth anything. And this is why you strive so hard. Some of us, that what motivates us in life is fear. Fear of rejection. That's why I'm going to be a good person. Fear of hell. That's why I'm going to work to go to heaven. Fear, fear, fear. But I'll tell you this right now. Anything born of fear cannot experience love. This is why 1 John 4, 18 says this. Perfect love casts out all fear, for fear has to do with torment. There is no fear in love, John says. No fear in love because fear is the opposite of love. So this is so critical. This is why often when, when God would speak with mankind, he would always say, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Believe. Now, what's interesting in Matthew's account, you guys ready for this? In Matthew's account of this same story, verse, this is chapter 9, verses 18 through 19. Chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. It says, while he was saying this, the synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just, ooh, is that a little bit different for you? Is that a little different? My daughter has just died but come and put your hand on her, and she will live. And here, Jesus doesn't have to say, don't be afraid, only believe, because clearly, my man Jairus believes, right? In fact, many would say that this is the first time Jesus brings someone back to life. So up until this point, it had never happened before. So Jairus going to Jesus, doing exactly what the, what the woman with the issue of blood did, just seconds prior, I mean, I mean, I mean, right, right after is this faith that has you using your imagination. I've never seen it done before. I haven't heard that you could do this, but I just believe that you can do all things. My daughter has died, but I know you can come to my house and she will live. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Luke and Mark have the same story. Matthew's the one that stands outside. Now, I'm not sure which one to believe. Which one do you think we should believe today? Which one should we believe? One has more tension. There's more drama. Don't be afraid. Only believe. And then as they're walking towards Jairus' house, someone comes to him who was at the house and says, Sir, don't come. She She died. So put a pin in that, because we want to come back to this. We want to come back to this. So Jesus says to them, do not be afraid, only believe. Now this is what I like about Jairus up to this point. The Bible lets us know that he's already put himself in a position to intercede on his daughter's behalf. The daughter is incapable of going to Jesus and asking for healing. And I want you to know there are many people in your life, many of your children... Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a close friend, maybe it's a neighbor that does not have the ability to connect with God in the way that you do because of their fear or because of their lack of faith, because they're agnostic or they're an atheist, and God still makes room for us to intercede on people's behalf. Now, I know you've heard this before, but you have to see how deep this really is. That God will answer prayers not because of the person's faith that we are wanting to be healed or restored or blessed or helped, but he will do it for the sake of the one who's asking him. Abraham was in a position like this when God went to visit him and they were eating and after they were done eating, God wipes his mouth and says, hey man, I don't want to hide my plans from you. Um, I've been hearing some crazy stuff about what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. I need to go check them and see if it's true. Because if I find out it's true, I got to put up some boundaries. And Abraham was like, well, wait a second, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. You, you going you gonna to put up boundaries? Yeah, I'm going to put up some boundaries here. I got I to gotta check evil. It's a cancer. And I, if this is really what's going on, I got I to gotta, I gotta stop this. He just said, but what if there's 50 righteous in the city. Will you, will, you, will you do that? 
with 50 righteous in the city? Won't you spare the 50 righteous for the sake, for the, I mean, spare the city for the sake of the 50 righteous? And God tells him, yes, your prayer request will be answered. 50 righteous there, I'll spare it. He goes, whoa, 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 what if there's 40? If there's 40, I got you. I'll spare the city. Ooh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> um, look, I know you got your plans. It got already in your itinerary and everything like that. But what if there's 30? Abe, if there's 30, I will spare the city. Okay, bet, bet. All right, cool. Love you, man. Okay, hey, I got one more. Just, I, I don't know. I mean, if you could do 30, can you do 20? I got you, man. If, 20, I got you. Okay, okay, hey, 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 I promise. This is Abraham's own words. I know you're God. I'm just a man. Please don't be offended. Please don't be hurt. But what if there happens to be 10? Now, who is Abraham really interceding for? Lot. Lot and his family. Lot is his nephew. And up to this point, Lot is the closest thing Abraham has. Right? Family. Yes, he has Sarah. Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. But all we know as far as his extended family is Lot. Lot was like a son before Ishmael. That was his little nephew. Now here's the crazy part. God is, st he stops at 10, but God knows what Abraham's asking for. And so he does save Lot. Watch this. Lot isn't righteous and neither is any of his family. According to the text, Lot has to be dragged out of Sodom along with his family because they didn't want to go. They didn't want to sit down. They didn't want to move. They didn't want to do anything the angels told them to do. They were completely afraid, unwilling to listen. But why did the angels drag them out? The angels dragged them out because of prayer. God listens to our intercession. Us being mediators between God and people is exactly who Christ is to us. Christ intercedes for us. Christ prays for us. That's the, that's the Bible. When Peter is bragging about how big and bad he is and he's doing the whole boastful, you know, go big or go home, Jesus says, bruh, <laughs> you ain't gonna go big tonight. You're gonna deny me. Three times you're gonna deny me. And you're going to get real lippy with it, too. You'll start cursing and swearing. It's going to be bad. But don't worry. I have prayed for you. The enemy has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. So when you return, strengthen your brothers. Oh, wait. Jesus prayed for Peter? God listens to our intercessory prayer. So parents, don't stop praying. Don't give up. Keep pleading. Keep asking, because these are the prayers that God wants to answer. And even if he has to take them by the hand and say, you coming with me right now, he'll do it. Many a people that have been able to experience breakthrough because they have parents and grandparents that don't stop praying. The father's interceding on his daughter's behalf. And I'm telling you right now, your prayer of intercession has power. In fact, when I was listening, when I was reading this and studying for this message, I started thinking about how often do I intercede for my own children? I guess I don't think about it that often. And maybe because they're not in any kind of perilous situation, but we should be praying for our kids even when all is good. Because we know it's just around the corner something that's going to be crazy, right? And let me tell you something, parents, I'm going to challenge you with this. Every day you fight to be closer to Jesus. Every day you make your way to Christ, every day that you make certain that you are before the throne room of God, it ensures, it ensures, it ensures helping your kids also to be closer to Jesus. Anytime you put the energy and effort to be close to Christ, it will, it will ensure, it will ensure that Christ will be closer to them. I know, I know, I know. Let them watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. I know it may sound like, but doesn't God judge them based on their own actions and their own doing? I just want to let you know there are people that will be saved, people that will be restored, people that will be protected because parents and grandparents sought the Lord. 
It matters. Don't give up on your kids. But pastor, it looks really, it looks really bleak right now. Ah, can't be any more bleak than Sodom and Gomorrah. Can't be any more bleak than, than, than you arguing with angels saying you're not leaving because you like your home and how comfortable it is. It can't be any more bleak than that. But some people, I believe, will be able to see and experience all that God has intended them to because of parents and grandparents. That's why my grandmother would get up at four in the morning, every single morning, to pray for her children and her grandchildren. I am an answer to prayer. Seriously, I'm an, do you know what I wanted to do when I, when I graduated from high school? I wanted to work on video games. I wanted to work for Pixar and George Lucas, and I wanted to do special effects and things like that. And you're probably like, Pastor, you messed up. You should have. But no, I, I, went to, I went to PUC to be a graphic design major. It was, the, it was the one of only two Adventist schools that had graphic design. So I'm going to start there, and then I'm going to make sure my parents and grandparents are happy that I went to an Adventist school for one year, and then I'm going to transfer over to San Francisco's art school. And that's where I'm going to finish, and I'm going to be in film. That's what I wanted to do. But I had a grandmother who would talk to me every single week, and she was only an hour from PUC, and I would go to her house, and we would sit in the kitchen, and we would talk for hours on end about God. And something was building in me, developing me. And my grandmother's prayers, I believe, not only helped transform me and put me on the right path, but what it does for others. What it does for others by, 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 by proxy of my ministry and pastoring. God is good and he listens, amen? So the Bible tells us that Jesus makes his way to Jairus' house. And this is what's really interesting here. Let's look at, let's look at uh, um, um, Mark chapter 5, verses 37 through 40. Mark chapter 5, verses 37 through 40. It says, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him after he put them all out. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and they went in there with the child. So Jesus only took Peter, James, and John. Do you guys know why he only took those three? Did he like them more than the rest of the disciples? It was, it was definitely a deeper relationship there. I would tell you that the relationship between James, John, Peter, and Christ was different because of their faith. Remember the time he went uh, to the mountain for his transfiguration? He only took... Peter, James, and John. For Gethsemane, he only took Peter, James, and John. The nine that were left behind in Mark chapter 9, who could not cast the demon out of the, the boy, when they asked the Lord, why could we not do it, Christ said, their lack of faith. Their lack of faith is why it could not happen. There was a measure of faith that Peter, James, and John had, and what Christ was about to do was next level. It had not, up until this point in Jesus' ministry, been done. And he needed people with faith to be in the room with him. People who were going to laugh at him could not be in the room. The Gospels tell us that there were some certain cities, certain towns that Jesus could not perform a miracle in because the people did not have enough faith. Now, did Jesus have enough faith? Absolutely. But the people did not have enough faith. This is why it is so critical that we have faith faith in order to see God work among his people. Don't put it on God. Well, God, you said you would do it, but you're not doing it. God is like, yeah, I said I could do it. I said if you believe, all things are possible. You don't believe. You don't trust. So I got to put you out the room. I believe there are some miracles that we never see because we don't make room for it. There are miracles that we will never see because we don't make the space for it. There are miracles that we will never see because we are too afraid. There are miracles we will never see happen in our life. When I started pastoring in Oakland, California, I was 26 years old. 
I had been an associate pastor at Loma Linda Campus Hill Church for three and a half years. And then I had my first solo pastorate in Oakland. I was pastoring a church that the conference told me in Northern California that if I did not succeed in two years, they would sell the church. And they would put me as an associate pastor someone else, somewhere else. They told me, we're hoping that you are so young that you, can, that you would think you could do it. So young and inexperienced that you think you could bring this church back to life. We had 25 people when I arrived. 25 regular people in attendance. My very first Sabbath there, because everybody's a looky-loo on the first Sabbath, we had a little over 100, and, and so I was already feeling pretty good about that. I said, Lord, you've already accomplished your will here. We're done. During the fellowship meal... Someone comes up to me and says, Pastor, I want you to come to my house. My nephew is sick, and I'm wanting you to pray over him. I said, sure. Do you want me to go right now? She says, no, no, eat, eat your food, and then afterwards, come over to the house, and, and you can pray for him. I said, okay. People are patting me on the back. I'm a young man. My grandmother's prayers worked, finished school, made it, own church now. We're going to shock the world. You know, I was, I was feeling it in Oakland, right next to the Raiders. I was feeling good. Go big or go home. So after the fellowship meal, I walk over to the house. It's, it's only a few blocks away from the church. I walk in through the front door. I greet the mother, and she says, my son is over here. It's a young boy, like 11 years old. I walk into the room. And the mother attempts to wake up her son from his nap. She goes, the pastor's here, honey. Wake up. The pastor's here. The boy does not wake up. She goes, oh, he doesn't really sleep this deeply. I don't know what's wrong here. Honey, the pastor's here. Wake up. Wake up. And as I'm looking at this boy, my heart drops. The mother looks at me with shock, fear, and disbelief in her eyes. She says, oh, no, Pastor. I think he's dead. So I go over to the boy, and I put my hands on him, and I nudge him. And he doesn't wake up. At this moment, I have a choice to make. The story that pops in my head is the, is the story, is the story of, of Elijah and Elisha. The story of Elijah and Elisha on two separate occasions. There's a dead child, a boy, a young boy, probably the same, around the same age, and, and they stay in the room and they pray and pray and pray until God brings these boys back to life. Elijah and Elisha on two separate occasions get on top of the child to keep the body warm, and they will not leave the room until God blesses the boy, answers their prayer. They're interceding. This takes faith. And at the moment, I have the blueprint. I know what I must do. Everybody needs to leave the room, and I need to stay here as long as I can until the boy comes back to life. But I stood there paralyzed because I was afraid. What if I pray and he doesn't come back to life? What if I stay here all throughout the night praying and weeping and, and he doesn't come back to life? They're all going to look at me and think I don't have enough faith. And I'm just starting my ministry here. So I didn't want to fail. Many things that God wants to do in our lives, in our relationships, but we don't make room for it. Failure is always, always, always a part.
part of the equation. It's a possibility. But failure and fear cannot usurp your faith. Many people in here who have given up on relationships because they didn't see a way out of it. It's impossible. It's dead. And Jesus has to say, get out of the room, all of you. Get out of the room. Get out of the room. Get out of the room. So I can do. But you don't understand, Pastor. I've been dealing with it for 20 years. I know the situation. They're deep, deep deep in Sodom, deep in Gomorrah. I'm telling you, this is different than anything else you've seen before in the Bible. And God is like, I've seen it all. Either we're going to believe that God can do it or stop playing the games. What's the point of singing how great our God is? We were up there singing and we're, and we're clapping Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Well, do you believe it or not? The problem is for us is that Goliath feels too real and too authentic. Um, The fiery furnace feels too inevitable. The cross is just too scary. But do you believe that God will never fail you? See, it's one thing to say it and with harmony, three parts, three parts. We're going to do three parts right now, and we're listening to the band, and it all sounds good. Yes, he will never fail. But this is not just a song. This is our blood. This is our breath. There should be something different about followers of Jesus when we face our problems, when we face our drama, when we face our mountains, when we face our Goliaths, when we face our walls of Jericho. There should be something qualitatively different, something that is quantifiable, something about us that distinguishes us from anyone else, and especially non-believers. We, in the face of our crosses, like Paul will say, crucify me daily. Does it mean I need to suffer some more? Then I will suffer some more for the sake of Christ. I believe that you can do it. If my daughter's dead already, if she's about to breathe her last, I don't care what it is. You might have been wrestling with this for 12 years. I don't care what the issues are. I believe it, Jesus. You can fix this in my life and fix it right now. And not everybody can be in that room. Not everybody can be in that room. Because some people in those rooms be like, girl, he ain't no good. You just need to start over. Some people in that room will tell you, bro, get out of it. That, she's crazy. Just get out of it. There's other fish in the sea. Some people cannot be in that room. And you need to know who you're surrounding yourself with. So Jesus says, everybody out, everybody, everybody out. The other nine disciples, now y'all, y'all can't even go in. Peter, James, John, mom, dad, let's go. The Bible says that Jesus, chapter 8 of, of Luke, verses 54, 56, it says, but he took her by the hand and said, my child, in the Greek, it's, 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 it's so sweet the way that uh, Mark shares it. In Aramaic, he calls her like sweetie pie, (laughs) baby girl, precious. The way that that her parents most likely affectionately called her. My child, he says in Luke's account, right? Mark's Mark's is a little bit different. Talitha kum in Mark chapter 5, verses 41 through 43, which means little girl, I say unto you, get up. My precious child, get up. And the Bible says her spirit returns to her. Her spirit returns to her. Now, this is a little doctrinal moment here. This is a little doctrinal. In the Greek, it, it's pneuma. It means breath. It can mean spirit. When, it's, when, it's considering, when, when uh, they're referring to the Holy Spirit, it will have holy in front of it. Holy Spirit. 
but when it's talking about pneuma, it can mean wind, it can mean breath, it depends on the context. In no way was this girl's spirit in heaven, chilling, having a good time, and God says, you need to go back to your body. She's like, ah, man. This is not a conscious spirit. This is not a conscious spirit. The Bible never teaches that there is a conscious spirit that leaves us and goes to heaven. The Bible says the dead know nothing, according to Ecclesiastes. It is the, it is the cocktail of breath and dust that makes man a living soul. Once you separate those two, man is no longer a conscious being. Are you guys understanding that? Once the electricity leaves the computer, it is, there is no possible way to power it on again. The hard drive is there in the physical machine. You need the electricity to access the hard drive. Same way with the breath. The breath that comes from God is what enables us to use our mind. How can a spirit see if it doesn't have eyeballs? How can a spirit think if it does not have a brain? The brain is in the dust. The brain is in the ground. I know that might hurt some of you because you want to be able to say, but my parents, they're in heaven right now looking down on me. Let me tell you something. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that we will not precede those who have gone before us. They won't either. The dead in Christ when he comes with the loud trump of God, the cry of the archangel, will rise from the grave. Not descend from heaven, but rise from the grave. And we who are alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. Amen? Hey, this is what's so cool about it. That means that we all get to go to the party at the same time. Right? And, and, and listen, don't trip. You're saying, oh, but that's so sad. My, my mom is in the grave. She's in the ground. She's just, she's just bored. No, no, no. It is like a blink. It is no different. The passage of time is no different from a person who believes that when they die, they go straight to heaven. For someone who believes they die, they're asleep and then go to heaven. There is no difference in the passage of time for the person who has died. Are you understanding that? It is the same sense of passage of time. So Jesus says to them, says to them she's not dead, she is sleeping. Because that is the most accurate way Christ can describe death, is to call it a sleep. He doesn't say, she's dreaming and she's playing with angels right now. No, 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 no. She's sleeping. The best way I can connect it with your understanding is to describe something you've all experienced. She's only sleeping right now. Isn't that a good thing? Watch, no, watch this, watch this, watch this. Pastor, I prayed for my grandparents to be healed. I prayed for my mother to be healed. I prayed for my father to be healed of cancer. And God says, I got them. But no, Pastor, no, no, you don't understand. They died. Oh, they didn't die. They went to sleep. They went to sleep. Oh, death, where is your sting? They went to sleep. And for them, it will feel like God came right at the nick of time. And he will answer every prayer. Get up. One day he's going to say that. Get up. Get up, my child. Get up. And do you think that person who was raised from the grave, when Christ comes again, is going to be like, Lord, but that's messed up. I wanted another 30 years on this planet. You think, you think Lazarus was happy when he was called from the grave? Anybody here want to believe that Lazarus, when he was called from the grave, was so happy that he was back in the dusty streets of Jerusalem? He probably was like, oh, Jesus, come on. Oh, my, you. Did you raise me back too early? And Jesus is like, bruh, your sisters were tripping. <laughs> Talking about, <laughs> like, if I only loved you, I would have been there for you. So, man, I got to, like, use you as an example right now. I got to teach these fools and these haters about how I am working on all of man's behalf and how I am the resurrection and the life. So you just got to hang with me just a little bit longer. But Jesus, I was sleeping and I was at peace. Now I'm late for work. I got you, bro. I got you next time. Next time you close your eyes to sleep, I promise you I'll let you sleep until I come in the clouds of glory. Go big and go home. 
family, we have to understand that all of this inner working in our life and us praying is all achieving for us something bigger, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. We don't fix our eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen. All these, he says, momentary troubles are achieving for us a greater glory that outweighs all of the problems we've ever faced. You're going through a difficult time in your marriage. You're going through a difficult time raising your kids. God is building something and growing something in you that is going to take you home one day. Because in my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would not have told you. You can get through these difficult times because they're building character and they're taking you somewhere. You're going to go big and you're going to go home one day. Amen? We're all going to go home. One day, we'll all be healed of cancer. One day, we'll all be healed from divorce. One day, we'll all be healed from HIV. One day, we'll all be healed from hate and anger and distrust. One day, we will never be hungry. We will never be thirsty. We will never be unhoused. One day, we will have everything our heart has ever desired because we have gone big and we've trusted in the one who always goes big and we'll get to go home. And we'll be able to be in the room with Jesus. They'll say, come on in the room. Come on. But you didn't let me go in the room 20 years ago. Well, you weren't ready 20 years ago. Still not fair. Man, you would have messed up the miracle if I'd let you in the room. Are you ready now? Are you ready now? The Bible says that the, the child came back to life. And the Bible says in uh, verse 42, immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were all completely astonished. And then he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. I'm, I'm sorry, how are you going to prevent that from happening, Jesus? And then I realized Jesus had a double meaning for saying she was asleep. He believed, obviously, she was asleep because for God, death is just asleep. But he also wanted to mask a bit what was happening, saying she was asleep and bringing her back to life. There were many of Jesus' enemies that said she was never dead in the first place. And Christ was like, that's okay. That's okay. I don't need that kind of publicity right now. I don't need that kind of attention because I know that kind of attention or have them trying to get me on a cross too early. That's why as soon as he brought Lazarus back to life after four days of being dead and no one could deny the miracle he had performed, what did the Bible say they wanted to do in John? They wanted to kill him. So Jesus is like, hey, 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 Parents, she was just sleeping, all right? You're not lying. She's sleeping. Just, shh, just, just, it just happened like, Maybe an hour ago, right? So people could believe it. Oh, we thought she was dead. Maybe she wasn't. But there were those who still knew, and they were astonished. Peter, James, and John walk out of the room. The disciples are looking at him like, what happened? We ain't supposed to talk about it. Oh, come on! Let's just go. No, 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 what happened? Matthew, don't you write about this. That girl was dead. Aren't you ready for that miracle in your life? Aren't you ready for that miracle in your life? My marriage was dead. I mean, dead, dead. Something happened. Aren't you ready for that? Aren't you ready for that? My children, Pastor, you don't understand. They were, they were dead. Aren't you ready for that miracle? How many of you are ready to go big and go home? To go big and go home. It's too late, Pastor. It's been a year. I can never trust him again. I know. 
It's Goliath, right? Impossible. Yeah, it's impossible. That's what makes it a miracle. God hasn't given up on you, but you don't give up on others. Amen? There's someone here today that wants that level of 4K faith. You want to take it to the next level. The Bible tells us that without works, faith, faith without works is what? It's dead. I would also tell you that works without faith is also dead. Only through faith can we please God according to Hebrews chapter 11. And so if you believe, family, let's work. And if you're working already, then mingle that with faith. There's someone here today, there's something big in your life, something, an issue that you've given up on, and now you realize it's not too late. Someone told you, nope, it's already dead. It's dead in the water. It's dead in the water. No need to trouble the teacher anymore. You're going to trouble Jesus because even if it's dead in the water, you know. And some of you knew before it was dead from, the, from jump, and God can still restore. If that's who you are today, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. Very specific, very specific, very specific. I see you, brother. I see you, sister. Very specific, very specific. I see you. And Mike, they just mean so much for you. Your mother sleeping in Jesus now. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? I'm ask the praise team to come forward as we pray. Father, thank you so much for hearing our prayer. Thank you so much for the challenge that you've given us. We don't want to give up. We want our intercessory prayer to be impactful. So we're going to keep striving. We're not going to be afraid. We're just going to believe. We're not going to be afraid. We're just going to believe. We know that you can do it. You've done it before. We know you can do it again. And ultimately, Father, we know that in the answering of our prayers, it's not just about the present But in answering our prayers, ultimately, it's about the future. It's about you coming again in the clouds of glory. We want to go big and we want to go home. We want to leave this place of trials. We want to leave this place of tribulation. We want to leave this place of tragedy and be with you forever. Make room for us because we want to join you in the room. And Father, although... We have spent many a time paralyzed. Today we have stood in declaration that our faith will have works and our works will have faith. Please, speak into our lives and touch us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen, amen.